Uh, are you guys ready to get into the word? I'm kind of eager to get in. We've been talking about the ascension of Jesus, which is a, a bit of a, a lengthy sermon series now. It's turning into like six or seven weeks that we've been talking about the ascension of Jesus. But that's because I, I, I've never even heard I don't even know if I've heard a sermon on it. I think it, obviously it's been mentioned before, but I, I didn't understand the intricacies of the ascension of Jesus and all of its implications for us, uh, for us today. So we're actually just looking at it piece by piece, all the things that Jesus is doing now that he has ascended into heaven. So you're here, you're about six or seven weeks since Easter. Does someone actually know how many weeks ago Easter was? You're here and you're, I don't know, six, seven, eight weeks uh, after Easter, but what you don't realize if you're a guest is that we're still in a post-Easter sermon series. We're still sort of riding the vibe of Easter. Jesus rose from the grave. For 40 days, he was here with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God and proving to them that he really uh, did rise from the grave. Then he ascended into heaven. Then 10 days later, there was a Pentecost where he sent his spirit to fill the church and then since then, after having been ascended into heaven, we actually learn in the New Testament that Jesus is doing things and we are invited to participate with him in what he's doing. So what is he doing? He's sending his spirit. Well, he's saving people and he's sending his spirit. That's what he did at Pentecost, but he's continuing to fill his people with the spirit. So we need to participate with him, receive his spirit, receive the gifts of the spirit, uh, see that the fruit of the spirit is being produced in our lives and then use that to serve others. So he's sending his spirit. He is interceding and advocating for us. That's a wonderful doctrine. And what we learned a few weeks ago was that we also, in joining him in his rule and his reign, his present rule and reign, as he has ascended to the throne in heaven, we are joining him by interceding for others and by advocating for others as well. So we join him in his rule and reign that way. Then last week we looked at the fact that right now he is presently putting into subjection all of his enemies. And he will reign until all of his enemies have been put into subjection. And I talked about sin and injustice and unrighteousness and all of those things, not just outside in the world, but even how it affects us here in the church and how we should be at work joining Jesus in his work, putting all things into subjection. First and foremost is our own hearts. You guys remember that from last week? Then this week, I actually want us to talk a little bit about the last one. This will kind of wrap up this whole series, which is he's not only putting everything into subjection, but he is actually making everything new. So it's a work of restoration, a work of justice, work of mercy, those kinds of things that Jesus is doing now to make everything new. So as we talk about that, I want to reintroduce a concept that I have taught about before, uh, and you may remember this, but it's, it's our human flourishing chart. So uh, if you've been around for a while, then you'll remember we've, I've addressed human flourishing from a number of different angles, and I've actually mentioned and taught on human flourishing at least a few times in the last several years. But if you'll go back to our Lord's Prayer series, which you can find online or on our app, then in, in the duration of that Lord's Prayer series, we talked about the Lord's Prayer. I actually addressed human flourishing, and I, and I looked at the Lord's Prayer through the lens of human flourishing. And then also our Psalms 23, or our Psalm 23 message series, I actually addressed human flourishing there too. So there's a part of this, and probably the next 10 to 15 minutes of this, which may sound like you've heard this before, or at least some version of this before, but I want, I want to address this again for us and remind us that this idea, this concept of human flourishing is exactly what Jesus is up to, and it's what we need to be up to if we're going to join him, if we're going to rule and reign with him presently, and then, of course, in fullness in his coming kingdom. But he is at work doing this. What does that look like? So in order to start, we need to actually go all the way back to the start. So I won't have you do this, but I would like for you to bookmark Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. That's the account of creation where God made the world and it tells us how he made the world and what his intention was for the world. So what his intention was for the world in terms of creation itself and even what his intentions were for mankind. So that's where we see all that God intended. And then uh, that was chapter one and chapter two. And then chapter three is where we see a massive falling away where Adam and Eve eat the fruit, they disobey God, and then they introduce sin, unrighteousness, brokenness into the world. So some of you are familiar with that. 
I guarantee you none of us are familiar enough with that that we can just walk away from it. We need to go back, revisit that. Everyone needs to go back and just look, especially at chapter three and understand that God had created it with a certain intention and those intentions uh, that God has have been broken because of our sin. So what I'm saying is, and what I want you to see is that God had, uh, uh, his desire in creating us was that we would flourish that we would be healthy, that we would uh, live in a, kind, a state of flourishing uh, that I would actually call, uh, I call it human flourishing, but I would actually describe it as right relationships in every area of life. Right relationships in every area of life. And so I've got a little chart that I wanna show. It's called human flourishing chart. And, uh, and I want you to see this, that that it's not just being right with God that matters, although that's the primary thing, I'll say that a number of times, but he also in creating Adam and Eve uh, in the garden and placing them there, they not only had right relationship with God, they had a right relationship with themselves. Uh, Now, I, I, I could prove this, but you'll just have to look for yourself. After they eat the fruit and disobey God, they felt something. Does anyone know the word, the thing that they felt when they realized that they didn't have any clothes on? Shame. Guilt is what you feel about what you've done. This is a very narrow way of defining these things. Guilt is a way of, uh, you know, feeling a way about what you've done. And shame is how you feel about who you are. Something wrong with me. I see a, I see a, a, a defect. I see a problem. I see it with me. And so shame is, is actually the brokenness in the area of right relationship with me, understanding who I am, what my value is in terms of my relationship to my creator. That's important. And I think it's actually in the creation story. They not only have a brokenness with God, they actually have a brokenness inside of themselves about themselves. They don't quite understand, uh, but they do feel shame. And then I want you to see too that, that God not only created them in harmony with God, relational harmony with God and even with themselves, but even in relational harmony with each other, Adam and Eve living together, enjoying God's creation together. And then that brings me to the last one, which is that God actually created them with the purpose of cultivation, a right relationship with uh, the ground, a right relationship with work, and a right relationship with rest, understanding that it work six days and rest one day, uh, a right relationship with not just uh, truth and not just work, but also with beauty, Something that stands out to me in the creation account is that when God created those, those, all those trees and he said, now you can eat from all of these trees except for one, the way that those trees are described is not just that those trees uh, had food that was good to eat, it actually says that those trees were good to look upon. They were, they were beautiful trees. So Adam and Eve were created with this ability not just uh, to enjoy each other and to enjoy God and, and to enjoy a right relationship with God, which creates a healthy view of self, but actually a right relationship with creation itself, understanding work and rest, understanding truth and beauty, understanding things like what you might call art and those kinds of things that really are important and creative elements to the human experience and existence. A right relationship with all of that I mean, if you don't see that in Genesis chapter three, then uh, you can have an email exchange maybe with uh, a commu- or, or talk with your community group leader and just sort of dig into that a little further. But I see those things and I see them as important for humans. Now, when Adam and Eve sin in the garden and they violate God's command, which his command was uh, not just that they couldn't eat of one tree, but that they could eat of every single tree tree in the garden except one. So what I mean to say is that it, we get it so twisted when we hear a command from, uh, from someone like an authority figure, you know, and I think that's because deep inside of us is a resistance to God anyways. But when we hear God say that you can eat of all the trees except just this one, if you don't mind, just I, this is my rule, but I, I want you not to eat that tree. We can have all the other ones. They're good to look at. They're good to eat. And what we hear and the way we interpret that is, you can't eat from this tree. And so I, God, am being extremely, extremely restrictive on your freedoms. Isn't that kind of wild to see? Now, you don't really understand the depths of that. I mean, you could actually, that's not fair to say, but I should say you get a, 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 uh, an even more uh, 
gl- a, a glimpse into this maybe even more deeply by way of experience when you have your own children and you try to convey that you can do all of these things, just not that, and somehow you have become someone who doesn't allow them to do anything, right? And so that's why uh, God gives us uh, children, is to know what it's like to create something and have it rebel against you. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We have children in here, and I'm just kidding. And I used to be a teenager, I'm just kidding. But I guess what I'm saying is, I think we can kind of relate a little bit that God had created them, was not restrictive, was actually very open with them, but we broke the rule essentially, we, we disobeyed. And it wasn't just that we broke the rule, we chose something else, something we thought was more favorable to us than a, a relationship with God, which was essentially uh, you know, our own desires and, and something that Adam and Eve perceived to be good for them. Now they were tempted by Satan in the garden, they believed those lies and then they fell into that. So there's a lot more we could discuss. My point is that at the moment of their disobedience, they begin to experience brokenness in all of those human flourishing categories. They immediately experience brokenness with God. Who are they hiding from in the garden? From God. There's a sense in them that something's wrong between them and God. Not only that, when they put uh, fig leaves on to cover themselves from each other because they feel shame, who are they also hiding from? Each other. And, and not only that, the, the, the shame that they feel is, is a, a, you know, a, a brokenness in the sense of uh, not only their relationship with God and each other, but even how they feel about themselves. And then I would say the last category is, is with creation. When, when God actually does come to talk to them and invite them to sort of get to the bottom of this, what he says is that work is a good thing, but now it's going to be hard. And so their interaction with creation is going to be toilsome, laborsome. And, and so this is where we see brokenness in all of those areas. And I, I don't know that I, I don't know I have to give a ton of examples, but I, I would like to be able to convince you that, that brokenness in those areas, in those categories still remain today. There's still brokenness with regard to God in our natural state. We still have resistance to him. We still have misunderstandings when it comes to him. And our relationship with him is not intact. It, is, it does not exist until we receive Christ and begin to, uh, to experience what life with him looks like. So the, the way the scriptures would present it, say like in Ephesians chapter two, is that we are dead apart from God who has to make us alive spiritually. He has to open the blind eyes, raise the dead soul to life. He, he brings us, to, uh, the dead spirit to life. He brings us to life and gives us sight. So that still exists, brokenness, and even being at odds with ourselves, there's, uh, there's fear and shame that plague us, and Christ, through his spirit, is at work undoing that, yet it exists today still, and even just brokenness with each other. Not just within the church, like relational tension, but nation against nation, tribe against tribe, uh, people group against people group, Uh, this kind of division exists today. And I want you to see that it's not just because people are stubborn or people are rude or people have an underlying preference or have some, it's it's because of sin and it's directly tied to the nature of sin that dwells in us. And it it, it's not new, it's just that we probably have more access to it. We, we see it more now, because if, I guess because of internet and, and the information age where we can actually see it on places like social media and news and television, radio, internet, those kinds of things. And so I don't think these things are new, I just think we've got more exposure to them and it feels you know, like, like it's all-consuming, overwhelming, and, and that we're sort of worse than we've ever been before. It feels that way, Um, but the world has always been a mess. Right now, there's a mom holding a baby who won't stop crying because it's hungry, but she doesn't have anything to feed it. And she's lost three of her children to a, a band of soldiers who have come to take them, one they'll use for pleasure and one they'll use for war, and she doesn't know what to do, and she's actually wanting God to come and do something about the mess 
that their village or town or country is in. In other words, you're not the only one thinking someone needs to do something about all of this. There's a lot of injustice in the world, and there has been, and it's always been time for God to come back. We've always needed him to come back to fix this. So certainly, I think you can point to things in our culture, in our time, that need to be remedied. And I'll address that in just a second. But what I want you to see is that actually, this has been a problem since the very beginning when Adam and Eve were in the garden, disobeyed God, and their oldest son killed their youngest son. That was the direct result of this brokenness. And it's been happening ever since. You guys see that? Good. So that's the brokenness that we deal with and, and that we have been dealing with. And God's intention is to restore that, to enter into that experience and redeem us. So the next point I have, it takes us straight to, to Jesus. Now, before I get there, though, I want you to see Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36 is... Uh, essentially for us, the idea that this, th that was written, you know, some 3,000 years ago. But the idea is that ever since the Garden of Eden, when, when mankind was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and we have lived in this sort of state of brokenness, we have desired to get back to that state. Back to that state of flourishing. Back to what we know as the Garden of Eden back to shalom or peace with God, back to a place of peace with ourselves, back to a place of peace with others, back to a place at peace and harmony with creation itself. We have desired that. And Ezekiel gives us a glimpse into that. So Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 33 says this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. When I cleanse you from your sins, that's the first thing, I will repopulate your cities and the ruins will be rebuilt. So does God only care about forgiving their sins and the salvation of the soul? That's it. The rest of it, yeah, who cares? Does that seem to be the posture of God? It doesn't, and it isn't. He says, when I cleanse you from your sins, and then I want to repopulate your cities, and then I want to rebuild the ruins, and verse 34, and then I want to rebuild the fields, the fields that used to lie empty and desolate, in plain view of everyone, will again be farmed. And when I bring you back, people will say, so it's not only just that he wants to bless you, but he wants to bless others, and he wants his work in your life to be a testament to others of the goodness of living under his reigning care. Verse 35, when I bring you back, people will say, this former wasteland is now like, what? We're finally back to where? The Garden of Eden. Humans whether they know the story of creation or not, whether they know about the Garden of Eden or not, are longing deep in their souls for a place like that. It's sort of utopian and, and that's natural because that's how we were created, it's where we were created, and it's where we've come from. And I would say it's where we're trying to get back to. It's what we want. He says uh, that the former wasteland is now like the Garden of Eden. The abandoned and ruined cities now have strong walls and are filled with people. Then the surrounding nations that survive will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruins and replanted the wasteland. For I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do what I say. He wants to bless, restore, heal, and he wants that to be a testament to the others so that everyone will come to know the blessing, restoration, and healing that is available to them too. That's his desire full-fledged, 100% hostile takeover of the world to bring flourishing. That's what he wants. The king of the universe is ascended into heaven physically, physical resurrection, physical ascension, physically seated at the throne in heaven and actually tangibly ruling today, ruling and reigning in some respects, but doing that through his spirit, through his church. So if we're going to join him, then I would say as a church, we would join him in the work of restoration and justice, healing, reconciliation, all of those things in all of those categories. Not one or the other, but all of them as God leads us, as his spirit leads us. So the problem usually uh, for, you know, I guess maybe the last 50 to 100 years is a battle within the church 
uh, regarding sort of conservative and liberal ideals and ideas. And what that's done with, with the church is actually forced us to sort of take sides with what would be more conservative or what would be more liberal. And so there's this argument about the fact that we need to just preach the gospel and see people get saved and come to faith in Jesus. The soul is what matters and they need to be saved so they don't go to hell and go to heaven, okay? That's one side. And then the other side is saying, well, we need to demonstrate the good news. We need to show love and help the poor and serve the poor. And it's what some have labeled as social gospel uh, or social gospel mentality. The church cannot buy in to the categories that people want us to fit into. It's both. I told you that last week. I knew I was going to get in trouble this week, so I set it all up last week. There's more that's both and than either or. There really is. And when there's tension, like philosophical tension or theological tension, I would like for us to be a kind of people to say, now wait, wait, wait. How is it that good people on both sides of this have Bible verses to defend what they're saying? Well, maybe that's because we need to uphold both of them, even if they seem like they might contradict each other. That kind of tension is actually healthy. The world was created with that kind of tension. I've used this example before, but I want to share it again, which is that we exist just by nature on a planet that rotates so fast that tr centrifugal force would throw us off the face of the planet. And it is so large that its gravitational pull would have us flat against the earth. And yet those oppos opposing forces have me standing up as it were right now, just perfectly balanced standing up. There is tension that we're supposed to uphold. Those two things are holding something together. That's what it is when it comes to the idea of, of, of human flourishing and the work that God wants the church to do. We proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because it really is the only hope we have, what Jesus has done for us. And it's the basis upon which we build everything else, that Jesus can save us so I could maybe feed you, I could maybe give you water, I could maybe help you uh, find a job, I could maybe do a number of things, and I think we should do all of those things, but at the end uh, or at the core is a real need for the person themselves to be transformed by the good news of Jesus through, faith, through repentance and faith in what Jesus has done for them. But it's not either or. There's a, it's, it's both of those that are necessary. When I, I'm not talking about getting, how to come to God. It's only necessary that you turn and believe in what he has done for you. But, but now as a church, as believers, we are joining him in his rule and reign, restoring everything, making all things new in all of those categories that I just listed for us. So we should be at work thinking, not just how do we get more people to hear the gospel so that they can become Christians. That's obviously important. We also should be thinking about how do we... Uh, undo the shame narrative for people and help them see that Christ has bore their, he bore their, their sin and their shame on the cross. Looking forward to the cross, he endured the shame for us. Despising the shame is what I, what I guess I'm saying. That's in Hebrews uh, chapter 12. Despising the shame, he endured the cross and bore the weight of our sin and shame for us. So how do we undo that for people? And then I think another category is how do we bridge the gap? Jesus is at work bringing relational uh, harmony to each other. And so I think we as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a people need to be able not only to be able to have opinions and, and, and make sound judgment and reasonable uh, you know, arguments. Uh, and I don't mean arguing, I just mean like reasonable points to make. We should be able to think critically and do all of that. I wouldn't wanna suppress that at all. But what I want you to see is your ability to reason and your ability to think critically and your ability to sort of line up a little bit more with one side or the other doesn't actually free you from the obligation you have in Jesus to serve first and foremost as a peacemaker, a bridge builder. That's your job. So I have opinions. Sometimes I share on the, on the platform and mostly I don't share except with my friends around the fire pit. I have opinions 
But my job is really, as, as your pastor, not to tell you what to think, but to try to get you to think about how to think and how to relate, how to engage with people. And not just the ones that you like, that you agree with. I don't have to teach you that. I'm talking about how to, this, that's the whole nature of uh, Christianity that sets us apart is that we love our enemies. So I'm trying to teach you um, what we know we should do. And I'm trying to teach us how to do that, which is we have to serve as peacemakers. Peacekeepers won't say a word. It's cowardly. But peacemakers will actually cause division in their family. You're not allowed to talk to them that way. That's making peace. So peacemaking is a bit counterintuitive because you're actually saying, no, this is not okay. And and in order to make peace, we're going to have to uproot a few things that we've allowed to exist in our family that I'm not okay with. And I want this right. That's peacemaking. It's hard work. It's bold. And I would say, It's entering into the rule and reign of Jesus. It's how he wants to transform your heart, your family, your city, your state, your country, and the world. That's how he wants to do it. So as I'm thinking through all of this, I'm thinking, wow, this this is a heavy work. How are we going to enter into this? First, I want to say that Jesus has already done all the heavy lifting. We are literally, as I've said, partnering with him, joining him in the work that he's already done uh, for us to save us, but partnering with him in the work that he's presently doing. So I need to go back to this human flourishing chart, and I want to demonstrate to you that Jesus entered into all of those categories so that in his resurrection, he could bring life and flourishing to all of those categories. You see that? When we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, a lot of us are familiar with the concept of a substitutionary atonement, which I actually do believe in. But we would say that Jesus actually died in our place for our sins to uh, satisfy the justice, the right and just justice of God, his wrath for our sins. That would be the first category of human flourishing. So I'd like to put up those uh, human flourishing categories again. And and I'd like for actually to go to the brokenness with relational harmony, uh, the brokenness that we experience. So this is the definition of sin and unrighteousness that we experience, but I want you to see how Jesus entered into these as well. The first one, like I just said, I think we all acknowledge. Yeah, he he actually went through the separation from God in his death, in his his, eternal torment on the cross for us, for our sins. But I want you to see too that there was brokenness and even odd, at odds with himself. He didn't... uh, how, how would I say this? Well, I mean, he says, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go through with this. And Jesus overcomes by saying, not my will, but yours be done. There's inner conflict for Jesus as he endures the cross. And he does it. Despising the shame he knows he's going to feel, he endures that. So he not only endures that brokenness in the first category, but the second one too. And he endures the, bro- the brokenness we feel and experience in the third category, at odds with each other. All but one of his 12 disciples have deserted him. The Bible says that he endured such hostility from sinners. I mean, he was crucified by humans. So he experiences the weight of the brokenness in our lives with that third category of just feeling the distance between himself and others, completely rejected and abandoned by his friends. He knows what that feels like. He has entered into the human experience fully. And even the third brokenness and at odds with creation, his own body, which should not have died, dies. The cells in his body stop moving and he dies. His body dies. And not only that, but even at his death, what we see are earthquakes and other natural phenomenon where the creation itself is breaking. It's dark for hours in the middle of the day when it's not supposed to be dark. He experiences the full weight and brunt of the brokenness of sin in all of those categories. And in his resurrection where he says, all authority has been given to me. Go and make disciples. 
I'm going to heaven. I will ascend to my rightful throne from, where, from whence or where I will rule and reign and I will send you my spirit. Go in my name, go in my power, go with my presence to do what? With what power to do that? To go with his power to bring healing and restoration and justice to these categories. Not the least of which is the first one. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. We're preaching the gospel. People need to come to faith. There has to be awakening in their soul where they realize Christ is the way. He's the answer. He's the one I've been looking for. But the church as a body and at large has to care about all the things that Jesus is doing in his rule and reign. And I would say it pertains to all of those categories. We join him in that. That to me would give us a well-rounded sense of what God is up to and how we join him in his work. So that's a broad sense. Need to look at the time. That's a broad sense of what Jesus is doing. I want you to look at Revelation 21.5. The one sitting on the throne said, look, or behold, I am making everything new. That's the work that Jesus is doing. The one on the throne, the ascended one seated at the throne is saying, I'm at work making everything new. Everything. The work he does starts from the inside out, but he's making everything new. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe he's at work making everything new. And if that's the case, then I believe we as the church need to join him in the renewal of all things. And that spans from sharing good news when it makes sense to share the good news. Uh, and, and it also actually spans to the way we work, to the culture we create around us in the home, the culture we create around us at work, the way we interact with people, the way we make decisions, all of that, all of that is how we partner with him in making all things new and leaving a, a, uh, an impact on the world around us. And of course, we leverage all of that for a chance to share how good God is and to invite them into that kind of flourishing. That, that is how we do this. That is the work we do. That's what the church should be up to doing. And so, and, and as I see it again, when Jesus rose from the dead, a grand reversal began through him. Now God is beginning to restore shalom and, and human flourishing. And that's who the church is. That's what the church is all about. A people experiencing restoration and healing, experiencing justice and righteousness. And they're actually not just experiencing it, they're sharing it with others at work, creating that kind of uh, flourishing for others around them, especially the ones they're responsible for, but for, for everyone. The church is taking responsibility for those things. There's a big difference between taking the blame and taking responsibility. Do you know that? There's a big difference between taking the blame and taking the responsibility. Does Jesus take the blame for our sin? But does he take responsibility and do something about it? Yes, he does. That's what leaders do. I would say that's what Christians do. We take the blame for what's ours and we take the blame for who's ours. You know, it's like Job making sacrifices for his kids in case one of them did something wrong that week. We, we don't necessarily have to take the blame to take responsibility and say it stops and, and I'm working on it and I'm gonna do what I can to fix this. So saying things like it happened 100 years ago, it happened 500 years ago, it happened uh, to my dad's generation or it happened in our family when I was a kid, but... I have no responsibility to any of the things that have ever happened in the world except only what I am personally responsible for is, in my estimation, uh, I don't know, it's just such a shallow and selfish way of looking at the world. I want us as a church to take responsibility and we don't have to take the blame. We can say and step into something, I wanna be a part of making this right in our family even though mom and dad had passed away and it was their fault, I wanna be the one that says, let's get together and work on this, guys. Let's put to rest some of this stuff. 
Let's be the peacemakers. Even if you agree with the sister that should have got this or the brother that, that uh, did get that and all this kind of stuff, peacemaking. But I'm also saying uh, in our culture too, there are actual issues in our culture that we have to step into and say, I'm here to try to bridge the gap and see that this people group gets along with this people group and, and what ends up happening when you do that. And here's why none of us are gonna do that. Honest to God, here's why none of us are gonna do that. You end up getting crucified. Was it the Jews that crucified Jesus or the Romans that crucified him? Was it the religious people or the irreligious people that crucified him? What's my favorite answer? Both. And now I think we're starting to see why Jesus said, if you're gonna follow me, you need to take up your cross and be prepared to die because no one else is prepared to give up their, their views or their tribe or their loyalty to that tribe or to their parents or whomever. And that's why Jesus says, I came to bring a sword, a sword between mom and daughter, father and son, brother and sister, because the hard work of making peace leads to crucifixion. So you're thinking, I just want to be a nice guy and I want to help people get along. Pick up your cross and get ready to die because you're going to say truth to both kinds of people that don't want to hear it. So who wants to be alone and die with Jesus? That's our motivational speech for today. <laughs> who wants to sign up for that? We have a connection card at the table. You can fill it out and say, I would like to die with Christ. I think we've sort of spiritualized that, right? Oh, to die with Christ is gain. Nobody wants to die with Christ. I don't want to die with Christ. Not at the expense of like my reputation. I don't want people to think I'm a conservative over here because I support this or believe that or a liberal over here because I so I don't want, I just want to try to keep the peace. And I already told you how I feel about that. I want us to be peacemakers, wade into the war and try to bring some peace and some reason, some shalom, some good news and show people that there's another way. There's a third or a fourth or a fifth, but there's a third way to look at this and begin to truly, truly uh, partner with Jesus in his rule and reign to bring this kind of flourishing with God, ourselves, others, and creation or cultivation or culture creation. Guys, that's a sermon. I'm probably going to get a nap today. <laughs> I love you. Uh, and, and I love our church because I think we embrace this. And I know I'm kidding. I am actually just kidding, saying who wants to die and then put everyone on the spot. And I feel the tension when I do that. But what I guess I'm doing is just charging us. Uh, and and I, I don't know how I would be doing this if I really genuinely felt that 80% of you just disagreed with me altogether. In other words, it's a little bit of a boost. I'm able to be a little bit more forward and, and push a little bit further because I have the sense that most, if not all of us, generally agree on these things. And so I'm proud of you. And I do wanna just keep pushing us forward. Well, uh, I'm going to end with this thought, um, that, that it's not just the work that Jesus did and then the work he's inviting us into, but even when you look ahead into creation itself, the final creation of, the, I mean, excuse me, the, the, the new creation when he comes in his kingdom and he makes a new heavens and a new earth, in that, <clears throat> excuse me, in that coming kingdom, none of that brokenness exists. And so I want us to see that this is something we're partnering with Jesus in now, but he's coming again to establish his kingdom in its fullness and none of this brokenness will exist. And when I keep that in view, then I realize and, and, and sort of import some of that into the present right now. It gives me joy and energy to realize that actually there's a day coming when all of this is gonna get made right. It might be one step forward, two steps back when it comes to helping somebody or even just realizing things for myself. But my hope is not that I'm gonna get it right. It's that Jesus has already gotten it right. He has already gone through the crucible. He's already gone through the depths of the brokenness of humanity and he has risen from the grave. He's reigning. He's coming back again to make everything right. And my hope 
really does rest in that. It's like a guy in prison who knows help's on the way. You know? It's like Paul and Silas who get imprisoned and they're just singing. Why? Why would you sing after getting beat and thrown in prison? Because help's on the way. Because there's nothing to fear and there's nothing to lose. That's the posture of the church. And we look ahead to a day. We look back to where Jesus had conquered it all. And we look ahead to a day where he's going to come and just set everything right. And I think those are our motives. That's the general purpose. Man, oh man. All right, I'm going to take three minutes and, and then I'll just ask for forgiveness. That's the general purpose of the church. But I want to try to help you a little bit with understanding a little bit of your purpose and maybe how you fit into some of that. When you look at those four categories, I hope that you wrote them down or I hope that you will or that you'll go back and listen and write them down. Because as you tell your story and write it out, which I would encourage all of you to do, I want you to actually chronicle the, 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 the way that you've understood your relationship with God. This is before you became a Christian and even now that you're a Christian and even maybe some areas that you, have, that you know you need to grow, but chronicle all of those human flourishing categories. What's the predominant narrative for me when it comes to my relationship with God? What did I used to believe? What do I still sometimes believe? What about myself? What, did I, what do I believe? What did I used to believe about me? What do I still struggle to believe? Uh, what do I struggle with believing the lies about me? Or even just what do I struggle to believe that's true about me now in Christ? Who did I grow up hating? Who did my family demonize? And are they really demons? Is there anything we can learn from that tribe or that people or that belief or whatever? Where is that brokenness in your life? Have you chronicled that in your story, brokenness with God, with ourselves, with others, and even with creation and your understanding of work and creation and rest and, uh, and, and those kinds of things? Because I think as you tell your story through the lens of how God created things, how things are broken for you, what you have experienced and what you believe to be true, even if they're lies or even if they used to be lies, when you start to chronicle that, you begin to see a pathway forward that if Jesus does this kind of work in me, then I can help others uh, who might be believing the same kind of thing or doing the same kind of thing. Now we're talking about you crafting a personal testimony that you can use to share with others that really does show them how Christ can save you from those things through his gospel. I used to be a control freak, but I released that to God and he's been helping me with that. And you know what? I feel like your anxiety might be rooted in some of that. I think there's really hope for you. Obviously, when you get to that point relationally to be able to communicate that. There's a, there's a way forward, but not until you do some of the work we talked about last week and that we've been talking about. Do the work, and I would say, hey, a little practical uh, tool here might be <clears throat> the actual human flourishing chart and working your way through that to ask those questions. Where did I misunderstand this? That's the first question. Have I gotten some of this right? Like my whole life I've cared about people. Okay, we're onto something. Maybe there's another question, like what narrative have do dominated my thoughts in each of these areas? What harm or pain or wounds have I experienced in these areas? What harm or pain or wounds have I extended to others? I've had to deal with both. What was done to me, what I've done to others. Where has God been most at work in my life since I believed in him? Those things he's been working on. And now you get a little bit of a picture, not just how he's trying to make my life better, but as we get healing and restoration and righteousness in those areas, we actually find a, a secret passageway to, to our purpose in life in terms of helping others. I, I, I want this for us, to live with that kind of purpose that's rooted in the gospel, that understands our story in light of his story, and that puts us on a path to really bringing flourishing to the areas around us, to this city, to this state, country, and wherever else God sends us. I want you to join me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. I pray, God, that you would help us as we, as we think about what it looks like to join you. I think the realest it got just now was that actually if we're going to join you, we're going to need to take up our cross and be prepared to die. But I do pray you'd give us courage for that. I think your gospel gives us courage for that. It removes the fear of dying and it makes us 
risk takers, people who have so much margin they can leverage that they're willing to wade into war and bring peace, speaking truth in love. God, I pray you'd help us to be like that. But I pray that you would give us the ability to see that all of this is rooted not in anything other than what you have done for us. And so I pray we would surrender to you and your good work and see that actually you have done all the heavy lifting and you will set everything right and it does not depend on us. We are partnering with you and we do it gladly. And so I dedicate myself and I dedicate our church to you. We partner with you, Lord, in your rule and reign, bringing flourishing to the people we're responsible for and to the people around us. Help us, Lord. Help us. Empower us with your spirit to this end. Send us with your presence. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.